the wake of the Me Too movement, the beauty pageant world is being forced to change. And this year's winner of Miss USA, Chesley Chris, is leading that charge. Miss USA 2019 is North Carolina. Chesley Chris says she's part of a new generation of pageant queens who are truly empowered. These lovely finalists know that it's clothes that make the woman. Pageants have long faced criticism about being superficial contests that promote beauty over brains. Such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as. Sending the message to young girls that to be valued, you must be beautiful. The debate largely focused on the swimsuit portion, which has a long history of controversy. Last year, the Miss America pageant eliminated bathing suits from the runway, saying that after the Me Too movement, it was time for change. But the Miss USA pageant decided to keep it, calling it empowering. Today, we explore the evolution of the pageant world through the eyes of Miss USA, Chesley Christ. Chesley Chris, welcome to Through Her Eyes. Mm, thank you. Listen, you just made history, <laughs> you know, not only for winning Miss USA, but for being one of three African-American women to have won Miss USA, Miss America, and Miss Teen. Mm -hmm. What message do you think this sends to young girls out there from all different diverse backgrounds watching, watching you um, in this moment of time? I think that this dream is possible for them because it's one thing to say you can do anything, you just have to work hard and get it, but it's quite another to actually see somebody in that position. But when there are, for example, no black women who are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, it's hard to actually sell that dream. But here in this case, with me being Miss USA and Kaylee being Miss Teen USA and Nia being Miss America, we've actually shown people like, yes, it's very possible for you. No, there are a lot of critics who denounce the swimsuit competition. Do tell me your thoughts about critics uh, of the swimsuit competition. Yeah, I, I think they just misunderstand what it's about. My family is full of athletes. My dad was a bodybuilder. I have two brothers who are D1 athletes, a pro athlete. And for us, we're excited about being fit, about showing off the work that we've done, and you know, just being, being healthy and athletic in general. Chesley was a Division I track and field athlete in college. She has an MBA and is an attorney specializing in civil litigation. You're a successful lawyer. Mm -hmm. Why still try for a beauty pageant? You know, my mom was Mrs. North Carolina 2002. She won a pageant for married women. And I remember being a little girl and thinking like, I want to be that. I want to be an example for other people just like my mom is. I want to be a powerful woman just like my mom is. And I want people to listen to me just like they listen to my mom. Chesley is one of six kids growing up in North Carolina from, as she describes it, humble beginnings. She says her mother taught her she could achieve her highest goals with hard work. Now, you're a biracial woman. You know, your father was white and or is white and your <laughs> mother is black. How yes. was that uh, growing up? I think it was challenging in that when I was growing up, um, it was hard to figure out like what my identity was. Because I grew up in a time when we didn't have mixed race or biracial as a choice on those boxes that asked you to identify what your race was. You could be black, white, or other. And so for me, being a young kid, knowing like these are the only choices that I have, do I really have to identify as other? And what does that mean? Eventually, I learned to just identify as a black woman. I still identify as a black woman, even though my dad is white, even though my stepdad is white. You talk about your own struggle with the decision about whether to whether or not to let your hair mm -hmm. be. Tell me more about that. Why the struggle to whether or not to let your hair be as it is? I think when I first started, I wasn't sure who could win. I wasn't sure like what that winner looked like and I wasn't sure if there was sort of a one note um, look that was always successful because I hadn't seen very many women with naturally curly hair competing, um, or I would watch competitions and I would hear comments from other people. I remember I was watching a competition and a woman was wearing an afro. Her hair was a little bit more coarse than mine, had a little less curl. They were like, I really liked her, but I just wish she would have flat ironed her hair. And I just thought like, 
maybe, maybe I can't do that either. Maybe I can't wear my natural hair. But eventually I grew over it. For me, you know, my not, this is the way that my hair grows out of my head. Why shouldn't I be able to wear it like this? And to me, it is beautiful. But what does that say about our society? We are in 2019 and African-American women still have a question on whether or not to let their hair natural. Yeah, it's scary. Um, but I think that our society is starting to normalize natural hair and accept that there are new standards for beauty. I believe there are two states that have recently passed laws that say you cannot discriminate against somebody based on their hair. There are several branches of the military that have changed their standards so that they're more accepting of natural hairstyles like braids and dreadlocks. And so it's a slow trend, but I think we're getting there. One of the defining moments in the Miss USA competition came when she was asked if the Me Too movement had gone too far. Her answer went viral. I don't think these movements have gone too far. What Me Too and Time's Up are about are making sure that we foster safe, and inclusive workplaces in our country. As an attorney, that's exactly what I want to hear and that's exactly what I want for this country. I think they're good movements. They asked me if it had gone too far and I said no. And I think her question was more about the division and the divide that people think that Me Too and Time's Up create between men and women. But I don't think it's about man or men shaming. Instead, what the movements are about is making sure that the men who, or the women who make our workplaces dangerous and unwelcoming um, are punished for that. Making sure that those people um, don't endanger people, don't make people feel uncomfortable in the workplace. That's what the movement is about, casting out those bad people so that we can have safe and inclusive workplaces. What, in your opinion, would take for the Me Too movement to have a, a long-term impact on our society? Well, we talked about CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Right now, there are less than 25 women not 25%, literally less than 25 women who are Fortune 500 CEOs. I'd like 50%. I'd like even more than 50%. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a Supreme Court justice, once said, you know, maybe we don't need five women on the Supreme Court. Maybe we need nine. Historically, there were nine men. Why couldn't we have nine women? So when we find equality in leadership and business and politics and, you know, in the legal industry, that's when I'll be satisfied. That's when I'll be happy when women have just the same opportunities that men do and are paid the same as well. Do you consider yourself a feminist? Yeah, I think everybody should be. It's really about women's equality and giving us the option to just be ourselves, right? Because when a man walks into a room, he doesn't have to speak for every other man. He can be himself. He can be Roger or Michael or whatever his name is. But when I walk into a room, I'm automatically a representative for all other women. I'm automatically a representative for women of color. And it shouldn't be that way. We should be able to be our own individual selves. Some feminists would argue that it's a, it's a pageant that objectifies women. Mm -hmm. How would you answer that? Well, I think there are so many different views of feminism. So when I was in law school, I took a gender in the law class, and it was incredible. And I think one of the things we learned was that there are some feminists who really think that you have to do everything opposite of what um, you know society thinks women should do, right? Society thinks that women should wear skirts, so you have to wear pants. I take a different approach, and that Today, today's woman should have the option to do anything she wants. If that means being a stay-at-home mom, do that. If that means wearing your skirt, wear it. But you should have the opportunity to have that choice and to make that choice regardless of what anybody else thinks. Now, what I find interesting is that you hold two juxtapositions. You know, on the one hand, you're saying a woman has a right to wear whatever she wants and be whatever she wants and that's her freedom. And on the other hand, you want a competition based on beauty, <laughs> yeah. right? How do you hold these two, two issues in your, in your opinion? Well, for me, the Miss USA competition is about more than beauty. I think at one point in time, especially historically, maybe when it started in the 50s, um, it was just about a woman's beauty, how well you walk in a swimsuit, what your body looks like. But nowadays, if you watch the actual telecast, you'll see that the competition focuses on the depth of the women who compete. We're very happy the Miss Universe pageant is just setting records. Donald Trump owned the Miss USA pageant for almost two decades. But during his presidential run, he made controversial remarks about Mexican immigrants. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. Trump was forced to sell the pageant in 2015 after NBC refused to air it. Do you think you would have competed if you were still owning the pageant? I'm not sure. Period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, let's talk politics. We have a major election coming up. 
There are lots of women running for election. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone in particular that you're excited about for the 2020 election? Well, there, I think there, we're still waiting on more people to throw their names in the yes. hat. You know, the Democratic nomination uh, is going to be huge. But one of the people I looked up to for years was Kamala Harris. I stand before you today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. Just a few weeks before the Miss USA competition, I went to DC and had the opportunity to meet Kamala Harris. Wow. And I just thought it was so cool because, you know, as a woman of color, as an attorney, um, as a person who wants to be a leader in my community, it was incredible to be able to meet somebody that I looked up to so much. Just Lee is also an advocate for prison reform, working to free low level offenders serving long prison sentences. You do pro bono work as an attorney. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so when I graduated from law school, Brian Stevenson happened to speak um, shortly after my graduation. He wrote the book, Just Mercy. We're trying to challenge injustice. We're trying to help people who've been wrongly convicted. We're trying to confront uh, bias and discrimination. It shocked me, it astounded me, and it made me angry to hear some of the injustice that happens to um, specifically minorities in our criminal justice system and people who don't have the economic means to afford private attorneys. And so I wanted to make a change and I wanted to do something because I was impassioned um, because of his work in his book. There is a report actually, maybe a lot of reports about racial discrimination in the criminal justice system, that actually a black man is to, is more likely to get 20% longer sentence than a mm -hmm. white man for the same crime, right? right? So in your opinion, how much does race plays a role? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the statistics speak for themselves in that, you know, people of color, you face a different fate when you come to the criminal justice system, and that's not right, and we need to fix that because we all have biases, all of us carry biases and they've played out in unfortunate ways for people of color. And I think admitting that and understanding it and working against it is what is going to help all of us. Will you ever go back to practicing law? I plan to, yeah. When I'm done with Miss USA, I hope to return to my firm. They're holding my office open, so I'll just have to like dust a little bit when I get back. But yeah, I'm, I'm planning to. Today, Miss USA, tomorrow, hopefully Miss Universe. I think the day after, hopefully a CEO of one of the Fortune <laughs> 500 companies. Yeah, or maybe managing partner with a law firm. Absolutely, you never know. You yeah. never know. You never know. <laughs> what a pleasure to have you two through her eyes. Thank you so much and good luck in your new journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.